he wanted to be about two thirds of the way down. Well, why don't we have one guy do there, one guy two feet further up then? It'll take you. Well, they're not going to be doing it together. Five days. Right. They're not doing it <laughs> together. Anyway, you see that you, if you look at that groove, you see it's a groove yeah. above, right where their helmets are. Right. You want that groove? Right. If they would dig right in that groove, right, right in that crack, I well, think you'd be in good shape. Okay. Good All right. Right in the groove, well, okay, right in the there. crack. Yeah. No, he's not. It doesn't answering. matter. But let's see where he's where he's hitting. You might turn out that that's where he's going to do it. Anyway. Yeah. Right above. Uh, I think that's where he'll on. do it. I think that's where he'll do it. Anyway. The problem is they don't have anywhere to stand. That's the reason they drop down lower so they can yeah, get a, yeah, some yeah. footing there. I got you. But that, I think yeah. if there's something there, we'll, 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 we'll go through. This is, it's either a big cave or it's a or it's a bust anyway. Either we're gonna get yourself a big hollowed out cave. We just got about a, a lot of bat dung. Yeah, but there's no point in starting big. But these are big caves. These are big small. caves. They're artificially yeah, hollowed out caves. Yeah, you start small to get in right. and see that there's something there, and then you make it bigger. Hey, who's been at this longest? Hey, I've been at this twelve years. It'll be like K four, or it's nothing. Uh, Kohab, you tell the Mata. No, no, the Mala. Ken, Ken, Shama. Higher, yeah. Zay, Zay, Ken. Yeah. All right, we all agree. Let them do it up there. Where are we saying? Fine. Uh, Zay, Ken. <laughs> Look at if there's anything. There they go again. <laughs> tell them. Okay, that's not how to. No. <laughs> you tell them all up. Okay, oh, they make a head. Okay. okay, for feet. Okay, 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 I understand. That's good. Yeah. Well, they seem to. They got a little rhythm going already, huh? This is really the big time now, man. David, you got something to tell your grandchildren about. It's this stone mountain. What they're doing there now. Nobody ever there. saw this in Israel before down here, I'll tell you. What they're doing right now is making a footing. Foot off, yeah, foot off. Richard, say that again. What they're doing right there is making a place for their feet, a, a, a footing. Yep. Yeah. So they can reach a little higher there. They need to. They need to be up. Uh, in another the, half. Of, uh, uh, another meter. They another, gotta be up. Uh, probably another meter. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I'd good. rather they were over more towards the crack, but let's not argue over a little thing. It's uh, hard to tell from here exactly what we we, we they, they've got a tape there, and we know we need to be down one meter eighty from the bottom of the gravel layer. And uh, it's impossible to tell from here exactly. They, they, they're going to have to move up a little bit. But they've got the tape up there. They'll just do a little measure. Let me just add that um, Richard and our colleagues, and um, we see things differently. Uh, Richard is a man of measurement and precision. I am a man of intuition. And I go by the intuitive view of where cave the, the four is, because if we have a cave here, it has to be similar to cave four. That wouldn't necessarily show. So it'll the way have we were to be on a there. parallel to cave four. So where the entrance you see to cave four is, this is going to be, have to be something similar, because the cave itself, if it's artificially hollowed out, and not just a natural crevice or something, which won't be that interesting to us, has got to be a naturally hollowed out cave in the architectural um, style of K4, because I don't think they have a lot of different architects in this group. Yeah, you feel that 
Ready. What was that? A rock fall. Rock. 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 One of what? Part of the rocks. It's fine, fine. The rock will hit the camera. They're far off. About the person, They're far off. They <laughs> you weren't here yesterday. We know exactly the length of the rock fall. This is exactly the place you want to check? Okay. I would go a foot lower, but Richard would want it there. We defer to the man who did the muscle yesterday. Okay. I'd rather a foot or two lower, but it doesn't matter. Okay. See, I would line it up more with the other hole, but never mind. Who is with Hanan in K4B? I think he's by himself. No, there's two people uh, here. Maybe... Hanan? I don't know who's Sarah, maybe. Maybe, uh, what's the other item? Richard. Richard. Popular name. Okay. Maybe it's Richard. And four B there. It's going to be four C for sure. What four C? No, no. This is not going to be four C. Well, if you won't find anything there, we won't go to well, we find something here. Yeah. yeah, if there's something there, it will be safe to We need an acronym. <laughs> we need an acronym between Aleph, Rej, Aleph, A, We need something like Arba, an acronym of Aleph, Rej, Aleph Bet. No, no, we can't call it Alba because there is Israeli students. And they know what Alba is. Okay. We need something else. Let's assume it will be 12, but for now... 12, <laughs> okay. For now, we can call it 4C. That's what we're paying for. That's a different model, Ken. It's, it's not 4. But this is the middle of it. Uh, if there is something, it will go in 2.5 meters, you'll be satisfied. Hey, uh, uh, um, that's right. Okay. Wow. Look, uh, Anand. Yes. Any manuscripts now are the mutual ag agreement area between you, me, and Broshi. Uh, as far as how they're. Well, how they're first let's find the documents, then we'll start. No, I mean, about <laughs> who, who, who gets uh, appointment. <laughs> the, the Israeli law is that we are on the license and therefore right. it's our responsibility. Yeah, this but is I by am law. a consultant. But we will consult with you about, about who yes. touches them. I like, like, we will be, uh, you there know, there are certain people that I and must... Ever will thank you if there, there is something there. Listen to me. There are yes. certain people, you have to be frank with me, I know. Who, will, who will not get the benefit of these manuscripts. Okay, okay. But let's okay. first find them. Okay? All, right. Okay. all right. Let's start by finding them. Then we'll first of all, <laughs> just quickly, quickly. Vermesh does not get the benefit, okay? Shifman does not get the benefit. Okay. And, uh... Who's the third? <laughs> that's that's all this about that's the whole list? And we want young scholars. Okay. Right? My prediction is they're going to be doing the same thing for quite a while, so I think I'm going to go. I think that's what I did. No, no, come on, Richard. They're going to break through in about five minutes. Yeah. I hope so. Oh, you have little faith. You have little faith. <laughs> Let's see. Look how I'm deserted. Everyone runs away. and we're About to hit pay dirt, maybe. Though I doubt it. Go Let's see, let me give him the, let me give him a walkie talkie. Here you go. You need here you go, you may need this one here. Oh okay, thanks. Okay. It's the walk talk is working, it's just uh I don't think he can get to it to talk. Because I heard it mm -hmm. up there. They're gonna be Right there for quite a while. <laughs> At least several hours. Uh, it's going to take them a few days. <laughs> you know, we'll let's we we'll let's see. I mean, unless they can figure out how to really get a something to. 
It's a beautiful mall. Out of there some kind of way, but they're going to they're be there quite I mean, a if while. If there were something, it wouldn't would be a, a nice place to put it. See, it's only so far you can reach they're it. They're in the hole right. over there. Yeah. So they, they're going to have to make a hole big enough to stand in so they can go on in. And so, so they're going to be there a while. I'm where's probably. Bill? Well, this is called Cave 4. This, as you can see, is not a natural cave. There may have been something here originally. It's an artificially hollowed out cave for the purpose of storage of manuscripts. If you look, you'll actually see holes where they probably had shelves, shell bar holes, just like a modern library. And uh, this was the mother load of all the Dead Sea Scrolls, what we call the Qumran manuscripts. Uh, in here were, no one's done a final reckoning. There must have been maybe 375,000 fragments of manuscripts in here, just piled up almost to the top, mixed with bat guana, you know, mud, dung, everything you can think of that had piled up over, over the years. Um, so when they finally, the problem was that they didn't find it themselves. When I say they, the archaeologist teams, led by a Dominican father called Father DeVoe, who had been a Vatican diplomat uh, right before the scrolls were found, and when the partition occurred in Jerusalem, he was Johnny on the spot to take advantage of the situation, not only as a diplomat, but as a very able political negotiator. So the Jordanian authorities uh, were not interested in having anything to do with the scrolls. So basically, as the Vatican representative in the New Jordan, Palestine, the partition having all already occurred, he presented himself as a person who could deal with the situation. So they led it over to him to control the scrolls coming in from Jordan at that time. From 1948 onwards, uh, the partition had occurred, so where the scrolls were being found was in Jordan, or uh, occupied Jordan, the West Bank. We're sitting in the West Bank area here, uh, recaptured by Israel in 1967. Between 48 and 67, therefore, Father DeVoe and his colleagues, the ones he chose and vetted, had complete control. In 1952, when Father DeVoe heard, after Cave 1 had been found, which had been found in the middle of the Arab-Israeli fighting, that there were more scrolls coming in. The Bedouins had found more scrolls, and not the archaeologists or the Dominican fathers, who he represented. He sent a survey team out in the field. This was run by Dominican fathers, and the people they used were Bedouins. So Cave 2 is what triggered it in 52. They didn't find that, but they found Cave 3. Cave 3 is up about a kilometer in the actual limestone clips, these are limestone marls, limestone mixed with mud. And that's what we call them marls. And so K3 had the copper scroll lying on the floor, just open, two rolls of copper. Turned out to be an incredible find, the temple treasure list. But not much else in K3. The next K found was this one, therefore we call it K4. This was also found in 1952. And uh, the point of this one is that DeVoe's surveyors had missed this cave, even though from where he was digging on the um, plateau of Qumran, where the ruins are, it's, it's visible by eye. He was questioned about that, and he said, well, he didn't think it was important, something on the morals, or else other times he's quoted, I think, as saying, I can't be sure, uh, he didn't see anything here. Uh, regardless of what he said, he didn't find it, and the Bedouin found that right after he did his survey, which is very uh, suspicious if not upsetting, and when the survey stopped and DeVoe went home, they cleaned this cave out completely and sent all the fragments up to uh, Jerusalem. And uh, one of the painful aspects of their having done that was the Bedouin worked in work gangs. And uh, they had to pay each other off for the money they received. Now the official team, what we call the international team run by DeVoe and his colleagues, uh, and we also call them con the consensus because they developed the theory of Qumran origins called the Essene theory. The consensus group thought that the way to stop a black market in scrolls was to uh, set a, 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 an official price for whatever they brought in. So they hit on a certain number of piastres, say 30 piastres per square centimeter. I don't know the exact price. It seemed rational to them at the time, but the problem was it worked to the detriment of large manuscripts. When the Bedouins worked as a team, and they found a large piece, and let's say five or ten Bedouin had been working on this, they would just rip it up in little pieces, give all the work members a piece of the manuscript, 
they take it up to the Jerusalem authorities and get their per square centimeter payment. This, we think, we don't have the proof of it, added to the destruction of the materials here in this cave. That gets us to your original question. What was found here in this cave? What was found here in this cave, aside from the terribly bad condition and the, 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 the numerous fragments, were, we estimate, around 2,600 different manuscripts. Of those, some were found in multiple copies, so we actually have 800 or so different documents. In this cave, therefore, this was the mother load of all common documents. Unfortunately, the condition was extremely poor of a lot of them. But through scholarly research and uh, careful examination, you could basically tell what kind of manuscript you were dealing, de dealing with through handwriting styles. You could match up the fragments with the same handwriting the way if I were in a classroom and took 30 student papers, ripped them up into little pieces, threw them on a big pile, and I wanted to resort them out. I would be able to see which pieces went with which just by the handwriting. You could uh, locate a given document or a given work of a given scribe just by the handwriting style. So that's how they did it. And that's why they became so interested in paleograph, paleography, and handwriting styles. Because the way they group documents, pieces together was through ha handwriting. Okay, so suppose you had about 40 some odd biblical books in multiple copies that were here. And every book of the Bible was found here except Esther. There's a reason why Esther probably wasn't found here. Then that means you had approximately about 600 some odd extra biblical manuscripts. Manuscripts that you'd never seen before. And that was where the exciting literature was. So we're talking about a huge catch or hoard of some 600 different manuscripts. The biblical manuscripts are interesting, but they basically verify that the Bible text we have now coming down through the Septuagint, the Greek text, and the Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, more or less have the Bible the way they had it here with slight differences. But the interesting things are the never-before texts. We call those sectarian texts or um, basically uh, non-biblical texts. So we have 600 some uh, out of those, and that's where the exciting drama of interpreting what the scrolls mean came into play. So this is K4, the granddaddy of them all. And what we're looking for next door is the granddaddy's cousin. Because our theory is this, that if they could hollow out this cave, suppose they had too many manuscripts for this cave. Why didn't they hollow out another cave right next door? Now, our radar ground scans have shown that there are what seem to be hollow areas in the several Mars adjourning this. In 1992, we did ground scans of this whole cliffs, up and down the whole cliffs, and we only found empty areas in one area, right in the Mars next to this one. So we're not pied optimists, but we hope and we believe that if there are additional storehouses of manuscripts, artificially hollowed out caves, that's where they're going to be, and that's why we're pounding into that wall. Were the books of the Bible um, exact copies of the Old Testament? Most of the books of the Bible that were found here, it isn't were they exact copies, it's whether the Old Testament as we know it are exact copies of these. Most of the books of the Bible agree with what we have in our Bibles. You know, even the Jewish and the Christian and the Protestant Bibles don't agree. Because if you look at your Catholic Bible, you'll see it has a different number of books than the Protestant Bible. It has uh, what we call the uh, Apocrypha or Pseudepigrapha. The reason is that the Catholic Bible came down through Greek Latin sources, the Septuagint that have, uh, that have been translated from the Hebrew in Alexandria in the 2nd century BC, and then on through scholars like Jerome into a Latin version in the 4th century AD, and that ultimately became the Vulgate. If you look, that differs from the Protestant Bible. Because when the Protestant Bible split away from the Catholic Bible, they said, look, why should we use the Catholic Bible? Let's go back to the horse's mouth itself. Let's go back to the uh, Jews. Presumably they know what the Bible was. So the Jews put the Bible as they knew it together, unfortunately, in 100 AD. That is after the wars against Rome from 66 to 70. By that time, Judaism was in control of what we now refer to as rabbis, the inheritors of Pharisaic Judaism. And they were very dubious about certain books of the Bible, so their collection did not reflect what may have been, uh, what may have been uh, operating uh, previously as so-called Bible. There was no Bible previously. As you'll see in these caves, there were only scrolls. Each scroll represents a certain book of the Bible. It takes a committee to put it together. 
So the Protestant went back to the Jewish Masoretic text, a text that was basically developed around 100 A.D. after the revolts. So they missed a lot of the books that the Catholic Bible had. I'll show you a conundrum of that, if you don't mind. The Maccabee books. We're now in the time of the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. But the Jews don't have any books telling them how to celebrate Hanukkah because the rabbis in 100 A.D. A a a determined in their wisdom that the Hanukkah books were troublemaking books that the Hanukkah books encouraged the Jews to revolt against Rome and be more obstreperous than was, uh, than was, good, than was wise for their, own, for their own good. But the Catholic books have the Hanukkah books, have Maccabees 1 and 2, but the Catholics don't celebrate Hanukkah. So how do you like that for a conundrum? The Catholics have the Maccabean books but don't observe them. The Jews don't have the Maccabean books but do observe them. The Protestants followed the Jewish Bible because they thought that the Jewish Bible would be more authentic. And that's where we stand with Bible books. So even the Bible books don't agree with, with each other as we have them. So we have basically variations from Bible to Bible, which makes the idea of the Word of God is perfect a little bit uh, dubious since uh, the different texts don't agree anyway, the different collections don't agree. But certainly the ones we have here are the earliest that we know of, of circulating text of what we would refer to as biblical books. But one should be clear, there was no final Bible yet at the time the, the scrolls were put in the caves. The law and the prophets did uh, enjoy special reverence. That is, the law of Moses, the first five books, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy were held in awe. You can see that they spoke of the Torah here of uh, Moses in, in the collections here. The prophets also uh, had already enjoyed special uh, 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 reverence. But the writings, what the Jews call the writings, the Jews separate their Bible into three parts. Law, prophets, writings. The writings would include things like um, Ruth, um, um, Ecclesiastic, uh, Ecclesiastes, Wisdom, a lot of books of that kind. Job had not reached a level of holiness so that the rabbi said it didn't, to touch them didn't dirty the impurity of your hands. They were just non-holy writings. And a book like, for instance, Daniel, but for the rabbis, this was a very um, uh, um, a questionable book because Daniel is full of apocalyptic revolutionary ideas. So if you look in a Protestant Christian Bible, Catholic Bible, you'll find Daniel put under writings, uh, put under prophets. If you look in a Jewish Bible, you'll find Daniel put only under writings, because the rabbis downplayed Daniel for the same reason they downplayed the Maccabee books, because these were books liable to encourage Jews to uh, embark on foolhardy revolutions, as far as they saw it, in, against great powers like um, Rome. Now, the last point about that, here in the Dead Sea uh, Scrolls, Daniel is held in very high regard, and he would have been uh, put among the prophets Quotation from Daniel are widespread in the, in the uh, scroll materials. So there, the scrolls show themselves more like early Christianity. I don't know if that's interesting to you. That may be too long-winded. No, no, that, that. i say one the word about Esther. Sure, please. And you can always cut if, if you want. Esther is a special case, and I think a very interesting case. Um, Esther is the basis uh, of the um, Hebrew festival of Purim. But if you look at Esther... What would be for uh, this group that is responsible for the writings here is a very hard-nosed, um, very um, apocalyptic, extremely uh, unforgiving, fairly intolerant, militant group. I don't think they uh, re re represent the, the normal picture of Essenes that people have. But one thing I think they would not tolerate, Esther shows a Jewish woman marrying a foreigner in order to save her people. Well, the scrolls actually would not even, con even consider that a Jewish woman should marry a foreigner or to be part of his harem just so his people could be saved. Because as far as they're concerned, they're very strict on these things. She would have been inv involved in fornication from the get-go. Basically, she sold herself to this foreign ruler. And uh, the scroll people would not have thought there was anything admirable about that having been done. Whereas Pharisaic Judaism 
which was more accommodating to far, far, far foreign rule, would have seen this as basically a very virtuous act. And so the Pharisees, uh, Rabbinic Judaism, the Pharisees, Rabbinic Judaism to be, includes a book like Esther in their writings. I think the reason Esther is missing from here is this book by, is this group by no means would have countenanced a book like Esther as being something uh, uh, admirable or recommendable. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah no, it does. Uh, in their eyes, she would just be basically a fornicator. Uh, were these Essenes or Zealots? Well, that's what the argument has been in Dead Sea Scrolls from the beginning. The DeVoe people, since they got control of the manuscripts, uh, laid down in, in conjunction with some other professors, uh, most of them at Harvard, uh, Frank Moore Cross and others who were here in Palestine when the scrolls came in, uh, developed a network, being all part of the uh, editing team, and nobody was allowed to be in the editing team who didn't uh, adhere to their original assumption that these were Essenes. Now, uh, people like me do not have anything against these being Essenes. As long as we define Essenes by what these documents themselves say, not by what people think Essenes are. In other words, if you have an idea which these gentlemen mostly had, many of them were members of um, orders or um, clerical background of one kind or another, certainly ministers, even uh, uh, Professor Cross, I think, originally had a theological training, uh, certainly DeVoe and his uh, French Catholic assistant from Poland, Father Millick, who did most of his translating for him. He was a, a, a good translator of manuscript. These were people who were actually uh, belonged to the Dominican order, which is a very severe order, and I hate to say, but in the Middle Ages where the people ran the Inquisition, but that's neither here nor there. You can, uh, you can cut that out if you don't like that. But the point is they vetted everything when it came in, and they didn't, since the Jordanian government had given them absolute power from 1952 onwards, they didn't allow anyone on the so-called International Committee who didn't agree with their views. So, the Essene theory became the official theory. The problem is, these scrolls did have Essene characteristics. Purity-mindedness, bathing habits, uh, references to the Holy Spirit, things like this. But that also had an extremely aggressive militance, militancy. And uh, what was clear from the beginning of looking at the documents, which makes the Copper Scroll so interesting... Uh, they had a political agenda, too. They were not apolitical. They were not uninter uh, uninterested in politics. But one thing they could not abide, and all the documents are consistent on this, they could not abide foreign armies in the country. So they really, this was really a national revolutionary movement as well as being an Essene movement. And, 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 and you have to go by the documents. And the interesting thing about the documents, some have said, oh, this is just a collection of documents. Norman Gold from the University of Chicago is well known. That's his single theory, that this is a collection of Jerusalem writings. No, 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 this is not a collection of simply uh, a Jerusalem writings. Some of them may have been penned there. These writings are consistent across the board. You never get a compromising document here. You never get an accommodating doctrine here. Do document here. You never get one approving of Roman rule or foreign rule in Palestine. You never get one approving of foreign appointed high priests. You never get one approving of fornication, of niece marriage, of uh, polygamy, of the king marrying a non-Jewish woman. I mean, these are like consistent down the line. So, let's go to the bottom line. What have we said? They are a combination of Essenes and, and uh, uh, Zealots. Well, we get these terminologies from a Jewish historian of the first century called Josephus. And uh, in Josephus' work, he outlines the different groups. Well, it turns out Josephus wrote several works where he changes his discussion. Josephus turns out to be a very slippery person. Some works he wrote in the 70s when he felt less secure, having been a turncoat and cooperating with the Roman imperial family, from which he got his name Flavius. He was the original Ben-Hur. He was adopted into the Roman imperial family and given their, uh, their name Flavians because they, the, they were the new imperial family that succeeded the Julio Claudians. So he was Flavius. But in the 90s, when he wrote his second work, his autobiography and his antiquities, he felt much more secure in his position, obviously, and lots of data that he didn't include in the Jewish war in the 70s, he refined and refurbished in the 90s. So suddenly he's willing to talk, tell us much more about the Zealot movement in the 90s than he is in the 70s. In the 70s he promises to talk about the Zealot movement, but doesn't do it. In the 90s he cuts a whole segment 
from his description of the Essenes in the 70s and puts it under his description of the Zealots in the 90s. So we see there's some fluidity of taking the, what the actual groups were. Finally, there's another version of Josephus that oddly was concerned by a curious manuscript attributed to a church father, Hippolytus, in Rome in the 3rd century. And this is clearly from Josephus. And there, Hippolytus says, and I think this is the truth of the situation, clearly quoting Josephus, there were four groups of Essenes. There were normative Essenes, there were Essene zealots, there were Essene, there, there, or, or zealot Essenes, there were Sicarii Essenes, and there was a fourth group. I forget what the fourth group was. But that means he recognized groups that combined characteristics of both. Now, the Sicarii Essenes really are interesting. Because the Sicarii Essenes, which I think Kumon really is, re- represents, uh, are the kind of people that Josephus hates in his work. That he calls, Sicarii means Roman short sword. It can also mean the circumciser's knife. It was the curved kind of knife that you even see Bedouins today carry across their breasts when you go down to the Arabian Peninsula. It was originally the Roman short sword, but it had a curve to it. It was also for Josephus a sort of the assassin, or the knife of the assassins, who mingled in the 50s among the crowds in Jerusalem and assassinated their political adversaries. A little bit like Hamas or something now, and, uh, or, 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 or Hezbollah or, or, or something like that. It also turns out that these Sicarii, the name is from Josephus, it is a pejorative because it means knife people. Uh, you know, I'm sure they didn't call themselves knife people. They had a different name for themselves, maybe Zealot Essenes. They certainly didn't call themselves knife people. That's Josephus' pejorative word. They're the ones who, it turns out, fled Jerusalem in the middle of the uprising and took Masada. And they're the ones who held out on Masada until long after Jerusalem fell, and we'll go down to Masada and look at it, until 73, where they committed mass suicide in the somewhat the Japanese samurai style killed all their families rather than allow the Romans take them prisoner, killed, killed themselves, some thousand, some odd men, women, and um, children. You say, what was the reason for that? The reason for that is rather than give their women and children into slavery to be used the way the Romans used people, uh, maybe sexually, maybe brutalized, maybe polluted, and so on, they wanted to enjoy the kingdom with their children. And the only way to enjoy the kingdom was it that they should be pure. So they, they, they buried under the synagogue floor, and we can show that at Masada, the bones passage from Ezekiel. The bones passage from Ezekiel is the passage about the resurrection and the rising of the bones. I intuited from that that the Sicarii believed in resurrection of the dead, and that they believed that, they're, that, that if they would uh, go Im- I- I- impure into death, they would meet each other again. In any case, the Sicarii group, ultimately other leftovers go down into Egypt, and Josephus tells us they're, 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 they are troublemakers in Egypt in the 80s and 90s, they're troublemakers in North Africa, so they continue this uprising. So I would think that what we have here at Qumran, and Qumran documents were found on Masada, is a version of this Sicarii Essene group. But I would prefer to call them the Messianic movement in Palestine. I think that much, was a much clearer name for them rather than all these pejorative names. Why the Messianic movement in Palestine? Which, again, gets us to Christian origins. Because over and over and over again, they refer to the star prophecy. The star prophecy comes from Numbers 24, 17, the prophecy that a star will rise from Jacob, a scepter to rule the world. This is in at least three known documents from Qumran and plays a central place. This is, for the Gospels, the star over Bethlehem uh, uh, paradigm. And uh, the world ruler, the Messiah, was supposed to be called the star as far as they understood it. And the second Jewish uprising that continued after the first, and there was a second one in 132 to 136, the leader was known as Bar-Kosheba, but he adopted the term Bar-Kokhba, Kokhba meaning star, son of the star, because he understood that the star prophecy was the moving force of revolutionary activity in Palestine. Josephus lets the cat out of the bag at the end of the Jewish war. He says, the thing that most moved our young men to revolt against Rome was the prophecy that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. And that's the star prophecy. So in my mind, what we have at, at Qumran is not only the literature of the Essene or Essene Zealot movement, but also of the Messianic movement and, in fact, the revolutionary movement against Rome. 
I'm sorry to give you so That's much okay, in one bite. Stop. I'm running mm -hmm. out of tape. Yeah, and you can you can ask me. You can. Yes. If this is all important. Shoot. Well, the the Hippolytus manuscript, which most people overlook, I find I only discovered it in more recent times, a tremendous eye opener because he describes the Sicarii Essenes, and it's a very odd to uh, group Sicarii with Essenes, and he says that that. What they would do if they heard anyone talking about the law who was not circumcised, they would either, like a Muslim in modern day, either offer him Islam or, or the sword, they would actually kill him or allow him to be circumcised. He could choose circumcision or be killed. In other words, that's how holy they took the law to be. So this illustrates a, a little bit of their mentality. Then he says... Then in our recent war with Rome, and Josephus says the same thing about Essenes in the Jewish war, but he puts it slightly different. He said, their bravery was incredible to us who were observing it. Josephus knew these things because he was an interrogator of a prisoner. He had betrayed his cause. He had gone over to the Romans. He had applied the star prophecy, the world ruler prophecy, both to Vespasian and Titus. In return, he had become their pampered uh, sort of... Um, uh, part of their entourage, given a Roman name. But he ended up, which is why his data is so encyclopedic and why we're so grateful for it, being an interrogator of um, prisoners. So he knew where, uh, whereof he, he, he um, spoke. In fact, there's one incredible episode in the war where Josephus is representing the Roman side and the city is under siege and all the revolutionaries are on the ramparts. And Josephus has been sent out by Titus, the, the son of the Roman emperor to be General Vespasian, to try to ask them to surrender. And he goes around the walls and he calls up asking them in their own language to surrender. And they're all watching him from the ramparts and suddenly someone throws a sling and, an, and a stone hits him on the head. And he falls, and this is a true story, I think, falls down in a swoon. And, and, and he admits in his manuscript that a huge cheer went up from the ramparts because everyone thought that their enemy, Josephus, was, was dead. Uh, this is a beautiful human moment. Of course, he did just get up, limp away, he has a wounded head. It would make a good Hollywood story. In any case, he says that these Essenes exhibited tremendous bravery under torture and participated in the recent war against Rome. Well, that goes against what most people think Essenes do, you know, not fight, retiring, are apolitical. They were one of the groups that were participating in, in the war against Rome. One of the leaders was John the Essene. Uh, we have a war scroll at, at, in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we call that Qumran, that, that dovetails very, very nicely with that. But he says that under torture, they would not call any man lord, whether the Roman emperor or Jesus, they would not call any man lord. You could not force them to call any man lord. Um, they, would not, um, they would not curse or blaspheme the lawgiver, Moses or the law or so on. And finally he said, and this is in Hippolytus' version, they would not eat things sacrificed to idols. Nothing could make them eat things sacrificed to idols. Now in the normal Jewish war, the earlier version, in Greek, Josephus says they would not eat f forbidden things. Hippolytus says they would not eat things sacrificed to idols. Go to your New Testament. Go to the exchanges between James and Paul. What do you find in the book of Acts 15 and 21? James bans things sacrificed to idols for overseas Christian be uh, believers. Repeats the ban in 21. Paul in 1 Corinthians 8 to 12 attacks James's ban on things sacrificed to idols. He laughs at it. He heaps scorn on it. He says, why should we worry about eating things sacrificed to idols? He says, idol is nothing, in, is nothing in this world. It's just in their mind. But he says, since these people are weak, since they have weak consciences, meaning James and all of the others, the leadership, the people who observe the law, because they are so weak, when they are present, don't eat things sacrificed to idols while they are here. Uh, and because of them, I will not eat meat again forever. In other words, I am a vegetarian, like they were. But in the very next chapter, he says, eat anything in the butcher shops. All, nothing, there are no uh, uh, forbidden things. And finally, in chapters 11 and 12, he goes on to evoke his doctrine of communion with the body and blood of Christ. He goes on, in fact, to talk about eating Jesus' body in symbolic form, as a wafer or bread and drinking his blood. 
which would have been total anathema to Jewish people. And if you look at Acts and James's instructions, along with things sacrificed to idols, is the ban on blood. So we have a real uh, confrontation there developing between Paul and James on just the issue. Josephus says was the thing that Essenes refused to bend on and, pr and preferred death under any torture. They preferred death under any torture for those three things. Not anything sacrificed to idols, not blaspheming the, the, uh, the lawgiver, and um, the third was um, not calling any man lord. So they preferred death, and Josephus admired the, uh, the um, uh, tolerance of pain that they showed in these torture sessions, which he was certainly present at and having a good deal of fun torturing them. Good. Sorry to add that, but you might...